the curve is fair, I've got these cut so when I bevel them, there'll be room for a nice tight root pass to get 100% penetration all the way across here. You're gonna have a rivet right through the middle of that tube and through the middle of each of the other tubes. Everything's laying in here flat or will be by the time I clamp it up. But I'm not ready to do that yet. I've got a lot of work to do down in these corners, riveting the bottom of this thing to the half inch plate that I've got tacked into the corners and trying to figure out how in the world Curtis is gonna get paint into some of these spaces that are so covered up. That's why I use Curtis. Transfer punch. These copper plates on the two sides are just to shim everything up nice and flat. The one in the middle is to provide a non-ferrous layer between the bottom of that root pass and that two by two tube. So there's no chance of welding the arch to the gate when I'm just trying to get 100% penetration weld at the butt joint. Don't want to have to tear that thing off. Want it to stay nice and flat. And so I'm going to put a couple little tacks in there at the corners, fill them up, and then start burning it in with probably four or five passes just to bring that up nice and proud. I want it to grind away and be invisible once this thing is painted. Now those of you who are actual welders need to tell me what's going on here if you can see it. I think I'm okay. Maybe a little undercut on that right side. Meat of the weld is a little heavy on the left, but that's all right. We're going to fill it up with two more passes. Okay, I'm going to jerk that back up here, but I'm going to let that just slack first. All right, I think whatever movement's happened is all that's going to happen. So I'm gonna pull it over here and clean this edge up. Here's what that copper plate looks like. Looks like it might have stopped a little penetration and sticking right there. Barely heated it up there, so I probably have a little void on the back side I'm gonna to need to play with. That's all right.
Okay, I've got three of these things drilled, orienting the connections of my three-point rigging onto this thing was a little tricky, but it's working well enough. This one's gonna be the tough one because I've gotta split that quill right between that chain. I don't know how that's gonna work, but I'm just not interested in re-rigging this thing. So if I have to just set this out back onto the rack and drill that by hand, I will, but well, I don't want to. So this whole ordeal of drilling these holes has been on my mind, like, for months. It's one of the plates that, you know, you, you have plates spinning in your mind all the time when you're building something. Because you know there's a challenge, you know there's an obstacle, you know there's something that you just don't know how to do, and you, you work on it, you grind on it. And this is one of them. That I knew that I was going to have to rig this thing with an adjustable connection on the third point in order to be able to take up or give out slack in order to make this thing hang level or close to level. And it is close to level. You know, I can clamp it sort of lightly to the table so I know that this drill bit will be going down through square. But I've been worrying about this for a while because I just had this idea that I wouldn't be able to get this thing far enough down for a regular machinist bit to do it. But happily, I have that bit. I think it's 12 inches. I use it for drilling through column caps, you know, brackets, metal brackets, where you need to shoot through a six by six post and hit the hole on the other side. A bit like this is the one to use. And as it turns out, I was able to get it just sharp enough to push it on through this piece of tubing, I think. Now one takeaway here is that the difference between a good hand who receives responsibility and promotion on a job site and one who just keeps banging along and never gets recognition or a raise is that the good hand worries about the job problems when he's home, even if it's not his job, even if it's just a job that he's working on. If you use your intellect and your creativity and your experience to solve the work problems before you get to work as if it was your own problem, Buddy, it's just a question of time until somebody figures that out. And if they don't, somebody else will. So I don't think I got this filmed, but it was a close one. Had about three quarters of an inch to spare. I know how lucky I am to have a crane in my shop. I remember that I started seriously looking for a jib crane to put in here about 2013 or so, and then I found this old boy, I think, in 2015, about a year before we started making videos, actually. And like every other force multiplier, it has radically magnified the work that I can accomplish. And I'm continually grateful to have it because of the number of things that I can do now, even as a 66-year-old man, that I could Never, I could never have even attempted some of these things when I was young. It's just one more example of the fact that heavy equipment and serious tools in general always find a way to earn their keep. All right, brought that header on there. Hit a couple blows like that, and then we'll get. Okay, and then. Right there. Drop your hands. Drop your hands down. Okay. Oh yeah. Pour one more heat on there. We're gonna like it. Look at that. Now can we perfect doing that every time? Yeah. What, repeat our process? Just cleaning them up, setting them down. Probably should have figured out some way to use a power hammer from the first. Well, 
Well, I've gotten all the painting advice I can get. Some of it from a friend on the Essential Craftsman Academy who said, Scott, that's the wrong stuff for what you're gonna do. And then Curtis Evelyn, my painting expert friend, said, Scott, here's what you do. You clean it with a solvent, brake cleaner. You warm it up so that the paint doesn't take a week to set up. And then prime the areas that he can't get to very well with this stuff. The notes, the, the uh, information on this particular stuff is gonna be in the notes. It's a spray epoxy primer. How do you beat that? You probably know that I love blacksmithing. I like to make beautiful things out of iron and the classic place to demonstrate your blacksmithing is in an entry gate. They can be wonderful, but I just, I didn't feel like setting aside that amount of time. I didn't feel like taking on that kind of a project. And even though my good friend Cy Swan objected, mostly this gate is fabricating, but I had to include some blacksmithing somewhere. And so this whole process of bending that arch and riveting it in place is a fairly practical and I think pretty good looking head nod and tip of the hat to blacksmithing. It would have been a mistake to not do something. And I couldn't think of any other way to include the craft, which is in fact the father of fabrication generally. I mean, it's the blacksmiths that put us on the road that has ended up with arc welders and lathes and milling machines and skyscrapers and so I had to at least put some hot rivets in this thing so that's two out of eleven four of them are these blind rivets that are riveted down into a countersunk hole this backside is going to be largely accessible for sandblast and paint so the whole bit about chilling it and you know I don't know how that's gonna work but I think it's going to be okay. The other side is a presentation side. I'll do the same thing on the other end and then start the longer rivets which have to go through the arch, through two inches of square tube and leave one and a half rivet diameters projecting to be riveted back to that kind of a bulging mushroom shape. I'm not going to try to put a head on them. Well contrary to what usually happens, the second time didn't go as well as the first time. I had my little anvil post on concrete, made it jumpy. I, th I will think of a couple other excuses, I'm sure, by the time I get this thing installed, but the bottom line is, it's got to work. It's got to work. Well, yesterday I blind riveted those two plates, and I had a different post anvil set up down to the ground. I'm hoping this one will work better. I'm going to try this one. I'm not running it through hot, I'm just heating the end. We'll see how this goes and then give you a look at what I've got it sitting on, if it works. That anvil is much better. Let me show you what it looks like. So this is the header. This is my, the leg that transfers the blow down to that piece of pipe on the gravel. And I have to line this up right here, the head, with that opening. Let's see how we do. Got it! That sounds good. Everything is down tight. Yep. Everything feels nice and snug. Let's see if we can do another one.
Apparently this rivet didn't get cut to length. It is uh, way too long, so I'm gonna cut that off in place with my bandsaw. One and a half to two rivet diameters, I may have already mentioned that, is what you use to create an appealing head, but one and a half is fine on this one. That'll be great. It's been a real pleasure to have Kenny in here with me while I've been doing this because fabrication is not his forte. Woodworking is Kenny's forte. And as soon as this gate is installed, I'm going to turn my hat around and move into the wood shop, building a workbench like Ken's. And he's going to have, I hope, a lot to say to keep me out of trouble. Thanks for watching Essential Craftsman and keep up the good work.